Good morning. This is the Kathleen Williams Show. And I've got the lovely Ian and Macmillan with me, who is the Kathleen Williams Show video creator. He's a fun creator. Good morning, Ian. Good morning. Good morning. What's it like there in St. Albans? Um, well, uh, yes, uh, summer is here and uh, it's very sunny. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, getting out and having a good walk actually at lunchtime. So it's and uh, what's very important is um, I've started to notice more bees. Bees with all the wet weather we had just uh, recently, there was um, no bees. And now I'm starting to see them coming back, so, which is good. I love honey. Ian, yes. yeah. how long have you been living where you are in St Albans? Um, uh, ooh. A long time. So it's uh, uh, 29-ish years, maybe 30 years, something like that. And it was only a temporary house. So uh, we bought this. Um, uh, uh, my wife had a place in London. I had a place in St. Albans. I bought it by accident. Um, when I was at, uh, I was looking for a place in London, uh, flat in London, and uh, Sarah, my wife, um, especially before we got married, uh, was looking for a place in St. Albans where she grew up and uh, she found a place, put an offer in and found a better place. So she said, you need somewhere? So I said, uh, okay, yeah, sounds good. So um, went and uh, uh, took the offer over and literally within two weeks, the place was mine. And I had no idea, as so I had to go and ask the agent, um, where is it? How many bedrooms? Couldn't remember anything. And I had no idea. And then... Uh, <laughs> It all went very quickly. Uh, and then so I went back into the office. Um, I was working for a big American bank. And, um, yeah, a bit shell-shocked. I think, oh, shit, I, you know, I don't know. My first, my first house. And um, he said, uh, yeah, you're off to America. Uh, remember we talked about this? I said, no. And we had a very drunk conversation in a very dodgy bar in Liverpool Street called Dirty Dicks down in the basement. And he said, um, do you fancy going over to the States? And he probably said yes or something. I can't remember. It's, yeah. In those days, the city was very, it was a very boozy place. And um, yeah, so anyway, I came up with the keys my first house. And he said, right, you're off. Passports, get all that sorted out. Um, yeah, you're off. So I had, to, <laughs> so I literally just had about a week or so, two weeks, three weeks before I was actually uh, in the States. Um, yeah, and we've, uh, so we thought, well, we'll just, Temporary house when we both decided to sell up. I probably said when we bought this house, temporary sort of stopgap, and we've been here ever since. Great Chris, no? Yeah, it's uh, very weird. Ian, you kindly helped um, create my show. Explain to listeners what it is that you're very good at. Uh, it's weird because um, uh, I, I once did my core process. Um, it's a weird thing, but it's uh, um, two words. Um, so it's a verb, uh, a verb and a noun, and uh, I've got three because that's me. Uh, and it's uh, my core process is seeing the way, not seeing ways. But it's um, so uh, when I was rescuing big change programs, I'd suddenly just take all that uncertainty and I just suddenly just see this path. And I think what, what I'm good at is actually seeing what people are trying to say um, and sort of finding sort of the words that work. Yes. Uh, and I think with, uh, with your show, um, that you've got to, you're doing something very strong, very interesting. Um, and uh, so, you know, all I did was, was just add a bit of branding on the top of it to sort of pull it together. So not much. Uh, but, but I always think that people... Um, come on shows like this because they want to get access to a platform so they can actually get their message out to further. Yeah. But um, uh, I always think that with your show, you're not, it's not like opera. <laughs> opera. Uh, you know, where there's, you know, she's gets into people and, and, you know, sort of gets to, gets, digs under the surface and a massive audience with you. What you're very good at doing is actually, Digging into people and getting, getting, you know, extracting. So it's a bit like a, a therapy session, you know, a light therapy session, a very polite one. 
where you actually get people to reveal more than they uh, than they probably anticipated. Um, so uh, I sort of know what I'm expecting, what's, what's likely to happen. Uh, but it's uh, it's not um, broadcasting out to an audience. It's more illuminating, shining a light on people so that um, they can then share it with their audience. It's a, it's a different thing. It's very uh, it's very subtle, but very powerful. Thank you for noticing and and illuminating um, several very interesting people. And I remember putting that tag on, on the Carolyn Williams show as um, a conversation, interesting conversations with interesting people. And yeah. that's, that's exactly what it is. So come back, coming back to an interesting person such as yourself, would you say that London is your home? Do you see it as your? Um, well, I was born there. Yes. Uh, and I grew up in, uh, in the centre of London. Um, and I, it's a fantastic city. Uh, I do like it. Um, but uh, yeah, I went out to school for five years out in the country. Um, and that was very weird. Um, so public schools, so you know, private school. But uh, most of the kids uh, had gone to a boarding prep school. So they were already indoctrinated to do things. And I thought, um, you know, me going to school on the, you know, having to go to school in, in London and sort of on the tubes and things. And I thought, you know, very weird, you know, everybody was too obedient. So I'd only got thrown out for um, <laughs> being a disobedient. I was always uh, lots of punishments. Um, but I, I thought it was nice to come back. I came back to university, um, to London. And uh, for me, that was just uh, reacquainting all the crazy things of the city. Uh, it was fasc fascinating, very multicultural, complex city of um, London. I think it is a fantastic place. Um, but I now live outside and um, I quite like living outside because we can just walk outside here in the countryside and whatever. But I do like going back in and I wouldn't mind actually living back there. Um, I grew up in um, uh, Notting Hill Gate. Um, so we had Kensington Gardens and um, Hyde Park and Holland Park. Um, fantastic parks just there. Okay. Um, um, so it's a nice, nice part of town. Uh, so I think I was very lucky. With um, my memory, if it serves me well, I can remember you being very um, happy as a sailor and anything to do with boats and anything to do with treasure. So enlighten us on that part of uh, it. Yeah, I, I, um, I used to uh, so I do quite a bit of sailing when I was much younger. Um, but, uh, not now. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, the treasure hunting was a crazy thing I just uh, fell into by accident. Um, uh, year, years ago now, uh, one of our, one of our, um, our number one son, he was only you know, just a small, about four, five, four ish sorts of age. So, can we have a caravan like Grandma and Granddad? And uh, my immediate answer was no. After sort of uh, driving with my dad in Scotland, where really he just bloody caravans. Um, and uh, yeah, two weeks later, three weeks later, we had one. And uh, it's very odd how we um, just went down to see a place. I had no idea what to do. We bought one and drove all the way down to Cornwall for the first time. We actually bumped into a group of people where we were staying that had kids the same age as ours. We all got on really well. And every year we used to sort of meet up there in the one particular place in Cornwall. And there's miles of sound, sound dunes that kids used to go out and play. Um, and then we'd uh, go and um, uh, drink probably a bit too much in the evening, watch all the stars and things. And one, one year, one of the families, um, husband was a lawyer. Um, and right at the very end, just as we're leaving, I think they talked to everybody else, but it was his wife. I said, do you fancy getting involved in this um, uh, treasure hunting thing? <laughs> and uh, I said, I don't know anything about it. So anyway, so I looked at an interesting perspective. Uh, and um, yeah, got a few people together and we put a syndicate together, put some money in. And uh, probably the most stupid thing we did, uh, I've ever done. But we we're trying to find a, um, a particular ship that was part of the, um, uh, sunk by the Dutch. Um, and then we couldn't find that, so we then looking for other ships, and we started um, salvaging 17th century wrecks off the east coast of England. That's right. Uh, the amount of dishonesty in that group was just phenomenal. 
Um, but I've got bits of glass, um, you know, ingots of glass, and coins, and um, uh, East India Company ships, and all sorts of weird things. But uh, yeah, so I lost a lot of money. Um, but I did write a murder story, um, but <laughs> based loosely on some of the things that happened. Uh, nobody died on my watch, luckily. Um, but that, that didn't happen until later. But nothing to do with me. But it just, I've never met so many dishonest people in that time. Uh, luckily, uh, somebody threatened me with a gun. We tried to get a cannon back. Somebody, um, uh, so tried to search cannon. You were mixing with pirates. Yeah, there's a lot of pirates, a treasure of trash pirates, and there's a lot of skullduggery going on um, uh, around the coast of England that you just never expect. So it's a, it reminded me of the opening of um, uh, the first uh, first opening paragraph of um, Brighton Rock, you know, Graham Greene's book. So sort of, um, I think it starts off with uh, within within half an hour of arriving in Brighton, he knew that they were going to try to they tried to kill him. <laughs> just this whole seaside side of um, you know, Brighton, and it's the same as part of these uh, east east uh, um, east coast towns. Um, very strange. Anyway, I woke up this morning and um, on sort of putting my show in front of me, and a memory came up that said that I had recorded our first recording this time last year. So in a year, explain to us what's happened to Ian. Uh, well, it's a story of other people um, to, an, to an extent. Um, it's a strange one because, uh, yes, my father had just passed away. Um, and, uh, yeah, he'd, um, uh, it was his time uh, in many ways. Um, it's a very bad dementia. And uh, so, it's, so it's, it was his time to go. It's, it's, it's always difficult. Um, we had a strange relationship, um, but uh, interesting character um, and tea dealer. But it always makes me uh, laugh to think that um, uh, you always think of the people that are the main users of Concorde when it's flying as businessmen and you know, bankers and CEOs and celebrities. But my dad was a frequent flyer. He used to commute. He used to live in Scotland. He used to come down to London, sip over to New York and come back the same day and night train back up to Edinburgh. So he used to literally do the uh, daily commute uh, over to New York on Concord. And he was one of their um, uh, more frequent flyers. So, he, so that was that was just before. Um, I think it was the day before we talked, something like that, Brace. Yes, a couple it of days was. Before. It was. Um, so I was still sort of coming to process that. Um, but also, um, soon after that, my wife found out that she, she needed um, she had the early signs of ovarian cancer. So she had a full hysterectomy. Uh, again, fantastic, the NHS service with all of the COVID and lockdowns, whatever, they did a fantastic job. Um, but six weeks after that, um, she was taking some injections. It's the only thing you do to, after an operation to stop blood clots. And then just literally just... Overnight, mood change. Suddenly, she had these two. Uh, found out that she had two massive blood clots in the lungs. Mm. So it just was quite frightening because yes. suddenly she just went very grey and blue lips, and we didn't know what was going on. Took her to a local hospital. They said right straight to the main hospital, and she was in there for uh, eleven days. And uh, yeah, halfway through there, the um, one of the specialists that seen the first day said, "I wasn't expecting you to be here. Um, we didn't think you were going to make it." So uh, it was yeah, quite tense. Um, and then there's other things that happened. So uh, melanoma came back. She said, I did a scan. <laughs> so she had a scratch on her leg at Christmas. She had a war print to get rid of the, um, thin her blood out, get rid of the clots. And, and it wouldn't heal. And a lump appeared on the leg lower down. So they thought it was probably nothing. She had a melanoma taken out 15 years ago. And over Christmas, it got bigger. So they did a scan. And while they were waiting to do a biopsy, so they stopped their war print. They just kind of found out she had a huge um, uh, brain tumour. Um, so that was whipped out. Um, it's all very sudden. Uh, she's very lucky she had um, the UK's top brain surgeon to actually do it because it's very large. Um, some fantastic things the NH NHS do. Um, um, the so part of UCL's, um, uh, UCLH, they've got a research national uh, NHS um, hospital for neurosurgery. Uh, neurotherapies, phenomenal things that they um, do in that uh, in that building, very cutting edge technology. 
So that was that. So that was um, that was quite simple. <laughs> it's very difficult to do, um, very large to do, but that was, turned out to be not malignant. So that was done. And then she had a big hole cut out of her leg to actually get rid of the uh, melanoma. And now she's on specialist treatments to stop the um, uh, cancer coming back. Um, so immunology treatment that actually um, uh, helps your own immune system to get rid of any cancer cells that may be there. But it makes you feel very ill. And um, yeah, she was uh, getting uh, blood oxygen was dropping uh, over the uh, uh, over the bank holiday weekend, so she was uh, rushed into hospital. And she's been there for just under a week, so she came on this day. So it's been me thinking, right, okay, time to actually get on. And just one thing after another this year. Um, so I find it quite difficult to uh, focus on me. Um, so is it, I enjoy doing the things that I do with, you know, with you, Carolyn, because to actually go and do the branding and doing a few little bits and pieces, it just creates a little bit of um, creativity, something to sort of, um, yeah, it makes me laugh, um, makes me smile. So some of the... Uh, uh, event things with the Snoopy and things like that. I just enjoy doing those things. Healing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I feel I feel as if we're at the things are not right yet. And there's a year of treatment to go through to help. Extraordinary um, year. Yeah, but it, but it's sort of stabilising. It's going to be tough for my wife, but I feel as if things are moving. I realise that I can't um, uh, go out to work, so I have to do everything. Online. And so as soon as you realise that, so you think, okay, uh, that means the world is now my market. <laughs> uh, I just have to find people that um, uh, that appreciate my uh, weirdness. Talking about people appreciating your creativity and your skills, who is it that you are um, targeting for work? Oh. That's a good question because I keep on going around in circles. Because um, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I I enjoy. So I've got that sort of. I, you know, I used to be a mechanical engineer, so I carry jump jets and uh, all sorts of things. Um, so I do like that sort of. But I'm also interested in like, when I was in London, I used to go uh, a student even. I used to go to the design museum. I used to love the just you know all sorts of things about design. So um, a well-made phone. It's also uh, topography, sort of, um, so the way that sort of type is used and things like that. So I always like sort of gra uh, graphic things. So I'm not particularly skilled at that as a, as a graphic designer. You know, I've got, I can't draw to say, you know, I've got an engineer's ability to sketch, but, um, but I like, I, you know, I, I love that sort of stuff. Um, so I, I do like sort of um, solving sort of systems type problems. I do like actually sort of thinking things through. And um, uh, so I like copywriting. Uh, I've designed all sorts of computer systems. I designed one of the world's first um, financial trading systems. Um, so I've got all those sort of stuff, but I actually just like keep it to sort of solving problems. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I'm looking at doing more problem solving type stuff. Um, uh, it's, something's popular at the moment, something called design sprints. You spend four days, five days, four days uh, solving a problem, but it's very focused on um, designing a product, testing a product or service. Uh, but I found something over in Brazil, uh, a method called the, um, the um, Mesa method, which, you know, Portuguese for table, where you bring people together and solve really big problems. Yeah. And I like the idea of doing that, but actually doing it remotely. Because sometimes when you're trying to solve a problem, a lot of problems, if they're technical problems or whatever, you know, there is a known solution. Just you, you may not know it, so you need to get an expert. That's fine, because that's just a, a hard problem. you just got to get on with it. But the, the really interesting ones is where you don't even know you've got a problem. Uh, or you actually, or there, it's, the solution is very difficult to know. You know, there's complex chaotic type things um, and that's where uh, you know, that's where the, these methods are much more interesting you've got to make a decision but you can't because you don't you don't have the context 
Um, and those are the type of things that I'm more interested in, so complex decisions and um, complex problems. And actually, um, design is important because you can't just brainstorm, you have to make. Yeah. So by doing something physically, actually making a prototype or just trying to describe it to other people by doing a poster or you know, making a video or doing something, by actually making it writing, creating a mock-up of a website or something, you actually then start to actually hone things in and say, well, does that work? So you may have a brilliant idea, but it's not practical. It's like um, a jigsaw piece um, in terms yeah. of, you know, you, you, you look for the pieces and you bring it all together to complete a whole. And that's how I see you um, in terms of my show and people I've come across and some of the events that we've put forward. So my question to you would be, where is Ian's happy place? Because you've gone through such a tough year as a family, where would your happy place be? Um, I, I, I just like, yeah, so, so I, I do enjoy um, doing big projects, project management, so um, not, I can't do the projects where it's going to be the same forever, but I just like doing the rescuing, so as I like being the centre, sort of not to be the centre of attention, but to direct the energy. Um, uh, and I'm, I, I do actually like coming up with the ideas, but I've learned to sometimes step back and actually let the people who need to, to actually do that, create the vacuum. Uh, so I, I'm just, I love taking the energy of the people and sometimes with there's politics. So I do enjoy that. Um, at the same time, I do enjoy um, thinking about words and ideas and, and messages and sort of, have you thought about, or are you trying to say that type of, because sometimes I sort of, uh, you know, I connect things that other people don't see. Yes. Um, so I just want to actually do more of that, whether it's um, writing simple copy to actually help somebody actually explain what they're trying to do. Absolutely. Um, but keeping it really simple, sometimes it's not the whole, it's just the, uh, what's the essence of it? Yes, you wrote uh, a lovely um, addition to my post on the weekend and you said about being in flow, that when we get together through energies, we smile more, we do more, we are more. And it was all about being, uh, developing and, and getting bigger. And yeah, it is. It, 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 that's the energy, the energy gets. It's the energy, but it's, it's, I think it starts up in here. Yes. Uh, and um, sort of a mindset shift, they say, I'm gonna do something. And then the energy comes in and, it's, and then the energy drives your thinking because you're actually connected now, you're starting to um, buzz. A smile more is definitely known to increase energy levels. That the having fun, I um, honestly believe that we need to inject more fun into a lot of what we do, especially during COVID and post COVID, because we've been, I would say, conditioned to being indoors and our minds have been locked down as it were. So my answer to all of that is to, to get outside to smile with each other, to laugh with each other, and to create. Yeah, I, I agree. So I think um, even though I'm, I've decided that I'm going to do more remotely and not do face to face, but it's actually, but I think that doing it over the, you know, there are, so I enjoy doing sort of events and things, but not the sort of formal events. I like doing the gathering type things where people can be people. Yeah. But I think you can do more. Um, you know, via technology, but it's nice to actually get out and get get some sunlight. It is. Um, uh, you know, just uh, I like so even if it's sort of you're walking sort of dusk, you sort of see things. Or, um, I'm I'm not an early person. But I'm going to try and go back to doing that. Um, but you just you just notice things. Uh, uh, you know, walking. Um, there's a new forest has been planted near where we are. Excellent. Uh, Somebody did actually take out their own planting, and there was actually a, a huge amount of marijuana plant in somewhere that okay. was discovered last year. But uh, but you see weird things like um, uh, skylarks have come back, so yeah. they're phenomenal when you see the skylarks are actually um, uh, flying. Um, uh, but also parakeets have come in. Um, but I see foxes. Uh, you know, you see all sorts of wildlife, and just the flowers. Um, yeah, I mowed my lawn uh, for the first time and I felt quite sad because I actually just let it grow. 
uh, yeah, I was chaos doing all sorts of other things, so everything just got left. But I just liked it felt like as if it was actually a, a woodland glade rather than just a sterile strip of grass. Yeah. Um, and now it's cut out, it, it just doesn't look so nice. Yeah. That's the natural part of you, obviously, you play yeah. games. Well, I, 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 like this, I like the light coming through the grass and then yeah. just little, um, you know, weeds, but they're, I quite like them because they've got nice pink colours and blues and things that are just scattered from wherever. That leads me on to how do you look after your body, your mind and your spirit? Uh, yeah, I think every so often I just when things get too much for me, I just like time for a walk. Yes, yeah. that works. Um, I've actually started reading, so I read a lot of stuff anyway, but I've actually started um, uh, a novel. That's weird because I haven't read, read a novel for years. Very sad. Um, and I started reading this book. I think it's The Martian. And it's fantastic. So it's a bit geeky um, because this guy is actually a uh, person who wrote it as uh, an engineer. But I just, um, so I'm just reading a few pages a night. So uh, I just um, I find that really relaxing just in the evening, it just gets you out of it. Um, and I didn't think I'd like it, but it's fantastic. Good. So you go for walks, you're reading books. And, is um, a, and, and about your spirit, how do you look after your spirit and nurture it? I, I, I've started writing again. So not producing anything else, but actually um, proper note taking. I found that I actually got my, my notes were just all over the place. I was hoarding too much information. So I've started um, uh, relating and writing. So I'm thinking like, okay. So I've got all sorts of tools to actually um, to automate a lot of stuff. But I just suddenly think actually I want to actually do things that actually I care about. Yeah. Um, so I see a lot of stuff, and uh, so rather than just taking notes to sort of hoard. I'm actually now starting to write about topics that I'm interested in. Yeah. So sort of my take on it and sort of synthesizing. Um, somebody said that, you know, your notes should make you happy. And what he noticed with his notes is when he was, um, when the amount of words that he put into his notes that were from other people, happiness was down. But when he actually increased the number of words that were his, like virtually all of it was synthesized from other people, maybe. When it was his words, um, very happy. So I've decided that I'm going to actually um, go the other way and stop pulling things in. Um, it's useful to sort of get ideas from other people and uh, read and or whatever, and just what you see and observe. But actually writing it down in a way that actually builds. Like music. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, we're not. I'm not a great music fan, you know, in as much as I don't sort of listen to enough of it. But um, uh, yeah, there's um, uh, one of my favourites. Uh, it's a couple of things. That, um, Heather, Heather Strange with a um, is it, uh, sort of a, a hero inside. I always think that's very Heather Small. Yes, I can't, I can't remember. That's she did the um, yeah. So she did um, yeah, Strange Fruit and all sorts of other things. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so, so the here inside yourself, I think, is always very good one. But I also like the Who. Yes, the Who. Um, the yeah, so who's next? I think it was a brilliant album. So lovely. The if you um, look at how you have arrived today, what would be your three truths truths that you would want to leave behind you, as Ian? Macmillan. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I've done some weird things. So tech, as a mechanical engineer, and then tech stuff, and then I got into banking and well, not banking, banking, but I helped a couple of banks not run out of money. So I helped them their, restructure their treasury or do their capital adequacy and all sorts of things. So I'm just looking at my two kids. Um, so we have some weird conversations sometimes about uh, thermodynamics because one of them decided to study engineering, but now has decided to become an accountant. So he's going through his um, uh, auditing. 
And the other one um, uh, is uh, currently rating banks, who works for a rating agency. Um, so all those sort of uh, looking at the bank side of things. Um, so it's very weird to sort of having the conversations here, but I just notice um, their thinking, how they think, and how they are. Uh, and I know sort of one son is sort of, you know, he's, and I just admire the way he thinks. Yes. He now understands that he thinks differently, and it's very powerful. Um, and he's got an amazing way of researching things. I just thought, oh, crikey, that's an insight. Uh, and the other one is very diligent, um, and, but he's got that creative, uh, although he's doing accounting thing, which is very detailed, process orientated. Um, when it comes to his engineering, he's very good problem solver. Yeah, like when that. it comes to uh, clever, clever engineering things. And um, yeah, I had a project um, that was actually in terms of university was a failure because he was uh, he had a year to do this project and um, he was taking over the work of some another team. And he couldn't get this steam engine. It was a model of uh, one of the old atmospheric steam engines, the ones that powered the steam mines first. It's about the, um, the, the Cornish tin mines. Um, and it was, uh, um, so it was atmospheric engines. Why was you put steam in and then you condense it? And it's the pressure of the atmosphere that's the power. Um, revolutionized. Very clever how they um, did it because um, they used a huge amount of less coal. So they sold the, um, uh, these devices on, on the amount that they saved. So they're never patented. So there's no patent. Um, but uh, so they had a model at the university he was at, and his job was to actually take it on and do some more work. But the model had frozen and stuck, and he couldn't get it to work. So right at the very end, he said, right, turn it into a calculation thing. And he said, uh, Dad, you, you know engineering. You know, you know this sort of stuff. Any thoughts? I thought. Crikey, that's really hard. How do you calculate all the things you have to calculate? It's really quite difficult. And um, yeah, just literally about a week before he had to put his paper in, suddenly in his mind just went ding, ding, oh, got it. And what he came up with was, was incredibly smart and it simplified all the equations down to nothing. Very clever. Uh, if he'd had time to write it up because he had a deadline to actually do it, um, he went to his supervisor, can I have some more time? Can't get, can't get any more time. In fact, he would have been allowed another three weeks. But so the paper he put in um, was very poor because he didn't have all the length of all the diagrams. It's still a good piece of paper, but the, the work itself is insight. Um, I thought that was very powerful. And that could actually, um, if we get back to it, uh, creating these um, steam engines the old steam engines as, you know, Watt and um, Bolton, from, you know, way back. Um, you, they would be fantastic power sources for low pressure steam all over the world. We've got low pressure steam out of bakeries, out of brewing, out of just crops that were being burnt. You can make low pressure steam and you can turn it into um, power uh, with these old engines that... Well, so, more knows? engineers. Yeah, the world does. So I think that I think he'll, he'll find something that will match that spark yeah. of creativity with something that's uh, maybe it's um, spark of entre more entrepreneurial business. But who knows? And your third truth, we've got two very close um, there. Uh, yeah, I just um, I just like seeing the way. I think that's my um, yeah, that's my core process. Uh, thank you very much, Nick Keep, for um, uh, it's. Uh, um it's a very interesting process um and i just think right i keep on coming back to that seeing just, the way helping people yeah, see the way yeah but not for me i can't see my own way it's like a taxi driver yes that, that, that tends to happen with um your meeting up for a second time in terms of my coming across you thankfully it's meant that we've been able to be creative, the two of us. And I wanted to finish this by saying thank you for helping me be more, smile more, loving more, and connecting more. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I'd actually like to say thank you because um, it's been a dark period. Um, I was actually, I hadn't realised it was actually coming out of a long depression um, that I flipped into. So I didn't think I did this and stuff. 
um, and that was sort of coming. Then suddenly my dad um, was just coming out of that. And my dad happened, and then on lockdown and all the rest of it. Then my well, wife being um, not well. Um, so I've sort of paused on that, but I found the conversations here, um, doing what we've been doing, uh, has actually been very helpful. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so you're, you're good at sometimes just needling, <laughs> but also just bringing that those things out. So I think it's um, in, in a nice way. So it's actually been it's been very helpful for me too. Meaningful. Yeah. Yes, that's the essence and my intention is to create more meaning and to connect with people like yourselves who are creative, who are engineers and help each other see a different way and help us see the way. So thank you so much and I look forward to speaking to you again. Sounds good. Thank you. Have a great day. I will do. Bye-bye. Bye.